Thank you very much, Alison. Appreciate it so much. Appreciate the praise team. Uh, I think the worship readiness team were the ones that were mentioned in the prayer sheet as the people to pray for this week. And they do such a great job uh, preparing everything, greeting everyone, uh, even having treats out for us. And, and just uh, wonderful to have so many do so much. Some do it out in front, some do it behind the scenes, but uh, you know, desperately needed and appreciated by, by all. So thank you very much. Well, we are in Exodus 20, and we're going to get to a, a bit of a, a controversy, or maybe not a controversy, maybe a confusion might be a better way to put it, because if you come across a list of the Ten Commandments, would you be surprised to know they might not exactly be the same? Uh, for example, here is a list, the Ten Commandments. Number one, I am the Lord your God, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Number two, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number three, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. And then nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and ten, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. This is a Lutheran or Catholic version of the Ten Commandments. If we look at the way we're going through the Ten Commandments, we have, thou shalt have no other gods before me, number one. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, and then the Sabbath day is fourth, and then thou shalt not covet is ten. See, what's happened is, in one list of the Ten Commandments, you have um, idol worship and graven images combined, and then coveting separated. We have idol worship and graven images separate and covet, coveting combined. There are various reasons for why that might be one way or the other because of the text, but um, this is, I suppose, traditional Baptist understanding. Most of the evangelical church, in fact, most of the churches other than those within the Lutheran or Catholic faith traditions look at it this way. So we are looking at the second commandment, and it is not actually Exodus 21 through 3. That is the first commandment. It is Exodus 24 through 6. Uh, chalk that up to operator error when I was making the... Oh, did you fix it for me, Chris? Oh, look at that. Our worship readiness team is really, really good. So Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you so much for, for you, for the fact that you have revealed yourself to us, for the fact that you have given us your, your word, the fact that you have saved us through your Son. You've done so much for us, Lord. And I pray as we look at your word this morning, you will help us understand better how we are to worship you and, and put you in that first place in our lives and make sure we don't, don't confuse you with someone or something else or don't give the worship and honor that is due to you to someone or something else. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray if there's anyone here struggling in their relationship with you or struggling to know you, that through the power of your word and the power of your spirit, you will reveal yourself to them today, even as we seek to see you and to know you and to serve you, and to worship you today. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, let's talk about by looking at the meaning of the commandment. And, you know, it kind of goes hand in glove with the first commandment. But here we have a specific prohibition against making images of God. And we find this kind of prohibition throughout the Old Testament. For one example, Habakkuk 2, 18 through 20. What prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath in it at all. In it at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. An idol in a representation of God in any form, 
any shape is wrong. And this, in a, this is a part of this commandment is a reminder that we shouldn't associate God with something created. That's one of the big parts of this commandment. You know, things on earth, under earth, we do not associate God with anything that he has made. Exodus 32, 7 through 8, we, we looked at this briefly last week. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the way this is phrased, they weren't looking at this as a separate God. They were saying, oh, this is a representation of God and we should worship this image. And God is saying that is absolutely wrong. And the reminder of this commandment is we don't take something God created and pretend that it is God and worship that image of God. And then we're also reminded that we're not to worship something other than God as a result of this commandment. This is, this is the um, idolatrous part of it. You can have a graven image that is supposed to represent the one true God. That's wrong. You can have a, an image, an idol, that represents some other God. And as we looked at last week, that is wrong too. Exodus 34, 12 through 13. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break down their pillars and cut down their asherim, the, the images of the gods and goddesses that were in the land. You don't worship other gods. You don't worship an image of God, period. And you don't do it because God is jealous. Jealous. I mean, he's the one who created us. He's the one that made us. He's the one that wants to be in a relationship with us. When he, when he chose Israel, he saved them. He brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. He brought them to the promised land, the land he promised to give to them. He, he made them victorious over the ones in the land who were doing atrocious and abominable deeds. He said it was like the land was spitting them out because of the evil they were doing, and I'm putting you, my, my people, in, and I want you to be holy. God was doing all of this for the nation of Israel, and they weren't always following him the way they were supposed to. Exodus 34, 14, For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. He's done all this for his people, and they were supposed to follow and worship him, and oftentimes they did not. That's what we find here, that he's a jealous God. When we find the description of what, the way Israel reacted at times towards God, we find that they are spoken of as though they were leaving their spouse and going off with a prostitute. They were committing harlotry with these other idols. And that should give us some insight into the depths of contempt that God had when they did this because he is a jealous God. I mean, what happens in relationships of any sort when you do that? If you have a spouse, if you have a significant other, a person you're dating, you're close to, and they all of a sudden go off with somebody else, how does that make you feel? How do you think it makes God feel when we're supposed to give him worship, supposed to give him his due, supposed to recognize him as creator and Lord and sovereign and savior, and we turn away from him. And that's what Israel did repeatedly. And here's the reminder. You don't turn to graven images. You don't put up an image that is supposed to represent me. You don't put up an image that is supposed to represent some other God because I am a jealous God. I want to be in relationship with you. You should want to be in relationship with me. And one of the reasons that images are so wrong is because they don't convey God's complexity. An image might capture something of God, but not all of God, and you might focus on what the image conveys rather than understanding all of who God is. And, and we get that hint here when, we say you shall, when it says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. When he reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, he says something very similar. 
The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And some say, well, that's a contradiction in Scripture because it says elsewhere people are responsible for their own sin. But you can do something so vile, so horrible, that the natural consequences of your sin or God actually bringing upon you punishment for your sin actually has ramifications from one generation to another, all as a result of your sin, okay? Doesn't mean that God is saying, okay, I'm punishing you and I'm going to punish your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. That can just be a natural consequence of the punishment because Ultimately, we are responsible for our own sinfulness, but we have to realize that our sinfulness has ramifications, and it affects our children, sometimes our grandchildren, sometimes our great-grandchildren. I was once told that one of my great-great-great-great-great, maybe, grandparents backed the wrong king in England, and that's why we ended up where we are. Well, there you go. I am no longer royalty. Oh, well. That just, things happen, right? There are natural consequences for sinfulness and punishment. And that's what it's talking about here. Because God does judge sin, but in addition to being judged, he is merciful and compassionate and loving. So what what image in the world can convey that complexity of God? When you try and boil God down to one thing or one image or a created being, how, how, how can you convey this? You can't. And that's why images are wrong. And when we look at the commandment in the Old Testament, we have to understand that artistry is okay. Okay, it's, it's, it's all right to make art, to have art convey uh, ideas. Uh, for example, Exodus 26, 31, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine t- Uh, twined linen it shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it this is a description of the curtain in the tabernacle in the temple there's artistry okay and we see this in first Kings 7 23 through 25 this is another part of the the worship uh, furnishings in the temple then he made the sea of cast metal it was round 10 cubits from brim to brim and five cubits high and a line of 30 cubits measured its circumference Under its brim were gourds for ten cubits, compassing the sea all around. The gourds were in two rows, cast with it when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. Art is not wrong, but the art we're talking about in the temple, in the tabernacle, all that, it, it didn't, it wasn't an image of God. Okay, it was an angelic image, an image of oxen to convey convey strength, whatever, but it wasn't an image of God because any image of God or a God is inadequate and wrong. Whether you're talking about uh, an idol, another God being worshipped, or something that was supposed to represent God, they are inadequate and wrong. We read this in Psalm 97, 6 and 7. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples see his glory. All worshippers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Nothing can, if you, the closest thing that can come to conveying the glory of God is the actual creation he has put us in. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. But it can't be confined to an image, and that's why the image is inadequate. That's why the image is wrong, whether it's supposed to be an image of God or some other being that you're being called God. And ways that the images are inadequate or wrong is because God is alive. Images are not. God is real. Images are not. The, uh, Psalm 115, 4 through 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. So, point is, stupid to worship a statue. Stupid to pray to a statue. Stupid to pray to any image that is supposed to convey God because the image isn't alive. It isn't real. And God is infinite. You know, God has been here all the time. Images are 
created. Images don't have power. Images aren't sovereign. We read this in 2 Chronicles 6.18. But will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. This is talking about the temple being made. Saying this house can't confine God because God is bigger. God is more majestic. God is more awesome. What, what image can convey that? And beyond that, God is formless. Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 18. This is um, Moses giving the second law before he passes on, goes away. And he's reminding the nation of Israel all that they've been through. And he says, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. Don't do it. Because you didn't see God. God is formless. God doesn't have an image, and yet you make him as an image. The warning is do not make an image of God in any way, shape, or form. And one of the reasons is because God reveals himself through words. A little earlier in Deuteronomy 4, verses 12 through 13, Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice, and he declared you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. God doesn't have a form. And the reminder here is, he speaks. He reveals himself through word, not image. That's why we have the Bible the way we have the Bible. And we're going to talk more about that uh, in a, a little later on. But the reminder here is that it's the word that is of primary importance because that is the way God chooses to communicate to us. So that's the, the meaning of the commandment, and the commandment kind of as it was revealed and seen in the Old Testament. Well, what about the commandment in the New Testament? Now, is, this, is, this, are the, is this particular command, as we look at all the commandments, is this repeated? Is it, is it uh, revealed in some special way in the New Testament? I think it is in, in multiple places. And first of all, one of the things we're reminded of is that images as idols aren't real. In other words, this isn't, I'm not talking about an image of the one true God. I'm just talking about an image as an idol that people would, would worship. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols. This was a big deal in the early church. I mean, you could get discount food because it had been left out in the temple for the idols. Of course, the idols didn't eat it, Right? So what do you do with the leftover food? Well, you sell it at a reduced rate, or maybe you go into a, a, a temple or a trade guild where they're worshiping a god or goddesses, and you have this food that was offered to the idols, and oh, they let us eat it, so we'll eat it. Are you allowed to do that? This is what Paul says. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and there is no god but one. For although there are many uh, th although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, for whom we are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom, we, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So all these other gods and goddesses and lords and beings out there, they aren't really real. So these images that are set up to them aren't Real. There are no real, there aren't really any other gods. Now, are there demonic forces? Are there things that would like to be worshipped as, as a god? Of course there are, Satan being the primary one. But there's only really one true God. And the New Testament reminds us that there is really only one true God. So you shouldn't worship idols. You shouldn't worship any other gods. And you're, you're looking at a, a society where 
in any given time, you could walk down the temple and one, uh, walk down the street in one of the principal cities, and you have a temple to this god and a temple to this goddess, and you could worship here, or you could worship there, or you could go in and, and ask uh, this god to bless your crops. You could go into this guild, this trade union where, where artisans and workers got together and they worshiped their own god and you asked for blessings. I mean, everywhere. Paul's saying, you know what? In reality, they aren't real. So don't worship idols. Don't worship other gods. But images of, um, even if it's not an image depicting another god, images of God are wrong because God is spirit. Whatever image you might put in your head as God, it's wrong. Because God is spirit. This is what Jesus says to the woman at the well. John 4, 21-24, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This goes right along with the Old Testament revelation of God being formless. Okay? God is not physical in the sense that we are. It doesn't look like us like this. Okay? That God is spirit. God is different. And, and we wonder how that could possibly be. And you know, when you watch movies about ghosts or this, that, or the other, and you have spiritual beings, uh, you know, so, some of the ones that... Uh, are, are, they tend to look like men and women, right, frequently. But now we have talk about other dimensions and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, reality could be different somewhere else or look different. And, and we, we talk about, um, you know, 3D, 4D, 5D. Maybe God exists outside of this physical realm, and I think that's what we're talking about here. You know, th this, this, you know God created this, so, obviously, he is greater than this. And the reminder here is that why would we want to make God into something that he created? Once again, God is spirit. And one thing that I think is a cautionary tale to all of us from the New Testament is that images in the mind are just as bad. You know, we, we, we think, okay, we've got, a, we've got a reminder here we aren't supposed to have an image out there that that represents God. And I, I mean, to be very frank, it doesn't need to be a picture. It doesn't need to be a crucifix. An image in our mind of what God is or what God looks like can be just as bad. Listen to this in Acts 17, 22 through 25. This is, this is Paul preaching to the people at Athens. And he's looked around and he's found, like I said, walked down the street, temple, shrine, statue, gods, goddesses, everywhere. And this is what he says. So Paul, standing in the midst of the uh, Areopagus, the, the primary uh, center of civic, um, civil law and all of that, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. There's kind of a summary of some of the things we've talked about already. Paul goes on, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the fa all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he, is not actually, that yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Where do the physical images come from? They start here. They start here. So we don't necessarily have to have an image in front of us that we're worshiping. The image of God we have starts here. So the warning is that it's not just the physical images of God that are graven. It's the images of God we have in our own head. So 
thinking about what the New Testament then says to us about the original Old Testament command. What is the commandment for us today? Well, you know, images are still wrong as we can see, but they're the only image um, we can actually worship of God is Jesus. Okay? Because we read that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, Colossians 1.15. John 14.9, Jesus said, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And the idea here isn't that, okay, just as, God, just as Jesus had a physical form, God the Father has a physical form. That's, that's the lie the Mormons perpetuate. Okay? That's not it at all. The idea Jesus is conveying here is, if you want to know what God is like, if you want to know how God would act, if you want to know what God believes, if you want to know all of this, you need to look no farther than me. But he is called the image of the invisible God because if we need a, a human being to, to follow, to understand what God is like, we look to Jesus Christ. And the reason we can do that is because Jesus Christ is in fact God incarnate. He's Emmanuel. He is God with us, having just come out of the Christmas season. Emmanuel, God with us. God reveals himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. We looked at that last week when we were looking at the first commandment. Jesus Christ, as a second person of the divine trinity, was in heaven being worshipped by angels and, and, and enjoying all the prerogatives of being God. And then there's creation and rebellion and we all deserve to be punished and removed from God's sight. We all deserve hell. But Jesus Christ, God, leaves heaven, comes to this earth, lives as a man, has a perfect life, becomes the perfect sacrifice when he dies on the cross for our sins. He shows us that God is holy. He shows us that God is is judged. He shows us that God is merciful. He shows us that we need to be punished for our sins, but we can be forgiven through his sacrifice. He reveals the nature of God to us. He reveals the way we can be saved. He reveals how we can be forgiven of the wrong that we have done in this life. He reveals how we can go to heaven and be with God forever. He is the image of the invisible God. And if we're looking for an image to worship, you know the image we worship? It's not stone. It's not gold. It's not some weirdness in our head. It's not something we make up. It is Jesus Christ. And that is why we are here today. And then going back to what Paul said in Athens, images in the mind are dangerous. Images in the mind are dangerous. Because one of the things we do when we have an image of God in our mind, and I'm not even talking about a, a physical image at this point, although you know we might want to just pause there for just a second when we talk about um, Jesus Christ being the image of God. And, you know, we have... TV shows like The Chosen. I actually showed uh, repeated clips every Sunday from the Gospel of John. You know, when we, 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 when we were going through the Gospel of John, you know, each of those has an actor that portrays Jesus Christ. And I think there's a problem. If when you think of Jesus Christ, you think of the actor in your head. Just being blunt, frank, okay? That's a problem. We shouldn't do that. We should understand enough to not do that, okay? But beyond that, in thinking about God and in thinking about who he is, we, we can have an image of him in our mind, and oftentimes the image of God, the idea of God we have in our mind is the way we want him to be. And, you know, that, that's just... Um, we can't fully understand who God is, and when we try and confine him... It's a problem. Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it, or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? You know, God is, you know, when we try and confine God to something in our head, it's a problem. For example, let me, let me explain it this way. 1 John 4, 8. God is love. Okay? This is, this is one thing that 
even those who don't believe in God the way we do and don't really believe in Jesus Christ, particularly as Savior and Lord, this is one they love, right? God is love. And people who claim to be Christians love this. God is love. God is loving. God doesn't want to punish anybody. God doesn't judge anybody. Anybody, God is love. Whatever you want to do is fine because you want to be like God and God is love. And people get this image in their head. And it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Because one of the things they don't like that it says elsewhere in Scripture about the love of God comes from Hebrews 12, 5, and 6. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons or children, let's say? My son, my child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every child, son, whom he receives. Part of love is chastisement and discipline. Well, you don't hear that when people want to talk about how God is love, do you? Because they get an image in their head. And they want to worship that image rather than the reality. And another thing besides making God the way we want him to be in the image on our head is we ignore the aspects of God we don't like, like the judgment. Now, this is this you won't be able to read all of this, okay? I I understand that, it's too far away. But this is this is take coming from certain coming from multiple theological books. This is a list of the attributes or aspects of God, okay? And, and um, so you can see there's a, there's a fair number of them as revealed in scriptures. Uh, that he, he is love. He is good. He is omnipotent. He is perfect. He, he, he has peace in himself. He is wise. All of these things, okay? But there are some in there that people don't particularly like. Like we read today, God is jealous. That's one of his attributes, because he demands worship. He is holy and righteous. He can't abide sin, and sin has to be punished. Wrath. I mean, there is literally an eternal punishment for sin. These go hand in hand with his perfection and mercy and compassion and love and goodness. And when we have an image of God that we put in our head, we oftentimes accentuate the things we like and get rid of the things we don't. And what is that but worshiping an image and not worshiping the one true God? And we have to be very, very cautious of that and recognize that the only picture we get of God comes to us from his word. His word, because he reveals himself in words. God has chosen to be revealed in words. This is what Paul says in Romans 10, 14, talking about the spread of the gospel, and how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching, sharing, telling, words, and then we read this in Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And you might say, well, yeah, they didn't have the ability to do things that we do today, like, like motion pictures and TV, and why wouldn't we avail ourselves of those things? And, and there are ways that those can be used and can be helpful. But one of the things we have to remember is if these things go away from the word and the primacy of preaching and teaching the truth of the word then we have a problem because God, from the very beginning, he had the opportunity to reveal himself as an idol, as an image, and he chose not to do that. In fact, he demanded that his people not do that. They were always to turn back to the Word. And when we find ourselves moving away from the Word, we have a problem. And it's interesting, going back to college and speech class, and then into seminary in preaching, there was a gentleman that was mentioned in both places. He was actually a, a Canadian uh, theorist um, on speech and culture called Marshall McLuhan. And he came up with a famous saying that is still used today, the medium is the message. 
And that is, there is something completely different from the spoken word compared to watching something on a TV screen. And they've, they've done studies on this. It does different things to your mind and stuff. And, and we know that images can be more, uh, can evoke feelings can be even more manipulative. You know, you talk about manipulation, and you can do that through the spoken word, right? You can tell a story that is supposed to bring about um, uh, sentiment and compassion, but there's something different about seeing it. And, it. and it was likened, I mean, they talked about this when they first showed the images of the starving children in, in Ethiopia, right? When the first time they showed that on TV, you could talk about it all you want, but it, something different happened when you saw those images. And people use images to this day to reveal, but also to manipulate. And you can do that with the spoken word. But the word itself affects people in a different way. It tends to be more, more logical. It tends to, to help people understand truth better because you can manipulate more easily with a visual and that was what the medium is the message meant that we're enter this started back when tv started and was saying we're entering into a whole new time in history you know you don't have to go to a play or something to see something you turn on your tv and it affects a person in a different way and the reminder we have from God from the very beginning is don't let the images mess with your head. Turn to the Word. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you so much for your truth revealed to us through your Word. We, we recognize, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that you use the foolishness of preaching to, to convey your truth to people. I pray, Lord, we will continue to understand that and, and realize that and, and not to build up images of you in our heads um, of people or things or the way we think you should be, but to always come back to the written word which you have given to us to help us to better understand you to help us to better understand who you are, to get us a full image of your complexity, and to be willing to worship you the way you truly are and not the way we want you to be. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.